If you're being like lied to consistently about what's really happening and someone tell you hear like the other side of what's happening and that resonates more with you, ultimately I think that's a positive thing, right? Because if we don't know what's actually going on, we can't fix the problem. And you could argue that like a lot of the lies and deception is to keep people from fixing the problem by thinking the problems are all um, other things. But it is depressing to have to confront that disconnect between what you thought was going on and what's actually going on. Um, but ultimately, you have to remember, too, that the reason so much effort and money is poured into deceiving us, it's because we have the power to change it. We are being lied to by everyone. Our governments. Big tech, intelligence agencies, the media, social media platforms, and every other source of information we once thought credible. This is the dire 2024 warning from Whitney Webb, a popular investigative journalist and writer who is relentless about exposing these lies. In a recent interview with Natalie Brunnell, Whitney peels off the many masks of deception and gives a chilling warning. Things are about to get really, really crazy. According to the accomplished writer and journalist, the global elites know that more of their lies are being exposed. So, they will double their efforts and other resources used to keep the masses distracted and subjugated. During the conversation with Natalie, Whitney exposes a grand plot to take absolute control of all aspects of our daily lives through the internet. Whitney explains that the first phase of the plot, to get us heavily dependent on the internet, has succeeded with a considerable number of the global population. The next phase is to get the internet under control using artificial intelligence. She warns that by 2025, artificial intelligence will produce more than 90% of online content, shaping reality for the global population however it wishes. Whitney also makes a ground-shaking reveal about the cryptocurrency industry, specifically about FTX, US regulators, and a plot to make a central bank digital currency, which ironically will not be controlled by the central bank. This is an important video you do not want to miss. Please watch, share, and like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. But ultimately, you have to remember too that the reason so much effort and money is poured into deceiving us, it's because we have the power to change it. And a lot of it just comes down to completely like nonviolent things people can do, like divesting from certain companies specifically, you know, lately I've been talking a lot about divesting from big tech as much as possible, just because of like where a lot of those big tech billionaires um, in the national security state, they're completely fused with at this point are taking us, you know, they're a lot of what they are trying to do is entirely predicated on us remaining dependent specifically on their technology when there's a lot of open source alternatives and like other like tech companies or developers that could be supported to develop alternative infrastructure. Like we don't need their tools and those tools can be made differently as an example. Right. So, um, you know, I, I know people sort of like can feel <laughs> black pilled, I guess, uh, when being confronted with this information, but ultimately, you know, um, I think part of the reason things have gotten, to the point they are now is that for so long, so many people didn't want to have to confront that disconnect between the reality we're told and what reality like actually is, you know, like what's actually happening. Uh, just because, you know, people had been so um, willing to like outsource, uh, you know, stuff to the government or the private sector or whatever, and not really follow up on it and just assume it's working the way it should. Um, that there are a lot of, you know, malfeasance and, and corruption is, has been allowed to entrench itself and grow. And that obviously has to be confronted at some point or it will just keep growing until it completely takes over and destroys everything. And we obviously can't have that happen. So you have to identify the problem to fix the problem. And you have to realistically assess uh, not just what the problem is, but what you can do about it. There's a lot of people, psychologists specifically, that work for, you know, the public relations industry or propaganda arms of governments, for example, or intelligence agencies that have studied very closely how to manipulate human behavior with technology. And I think... Um, when you consider that like a lot of social media companies have their origins with intelligence, or if they didn't at the beginning, they certainly do now. Um, and how they know that, you know, the like news feeds on social media can be used to manipulate people's emotions um, or manipulate how people perceive events and reality, they leverage that.
And to think they don't leverage that, I think would be really naive. So as an example, one that's like sort of well-known and easy to find if you search for it online um, is Facebook attempting to uh, study how to manipulate people's emotions to make them feel like more negatively, like intentionally make them more depressed by bombarding them with like largely negative news on their newsfeed, right? And so, you know, we can assume that they do that with all sorts of things and specific events. And when you consider the fact that we know now, um, and we've known for some time, quite frankly, that a lot of these companies, for example, selectively censor things, uh, you know, they're trying to cultivate the public's perception of mm-hmm. events and reality and, and all sorts of different things. And so social media is a big tool for that. And then also, you know, the whole like dopamine stuff with like, and like attention span impacts that, you know, social media and like stuff like TikTok and all of that is having on people. Um, You know, it's not really talked about enough. And for those of us that lived a decent part of our lives without that stuff, it affects us differently than like little kids that are exposed to that from extremely young ages. And how does that affect the brain? How does it affect socialization when all of that is still like developing? Um, you know, I think a lot of that has had like mostly negative impacts and a lot of it doesn't get talked about. It gets normalized. And, uh, you know, there's a whole, I mean, we could do probably a whole podcast just discussing like all the different impacts that that has on people and, uh, and the type of impact it's had on different generations. Um, the, uh, another big problem, though, that does come up a lot in my work is the role of like how that data produced by all of this is harvested by intelligence agencies and then fed into AI tied up with like this blob of Silicon Valley national security stuff. Cause they really are fused. I mean, one, the, they're the private contractors for the intelligence agencies and there's a lot of overlap at this point. At the moment, quite a number of moves are being made to regulate social media platforms and presumably make them safer, especially for children. An example is the UK's online safety act. According to Whitney, this and similar legislation that seeks to mandate linking verified IDs to social media platforms are shams carefully designed to disarm the population until every aspect of our lives can be easily monitored and surveilled. During the interview, Whitney makes another huge reveal about FTX, specifically how the exchange was and continues to be a huge industry plant. Let's get back to the interview. So you may remember from the FTX scandal last year that there was like this weird bank in rural Washington that's like basically like broom closet size, like one branch bank that had like less Mm -hmm. than, uh, significantly less than like 10, like $10 million in deposits before it was bought by this entity called FBH Corp, which was basically uh, the current chief compliance officer of Binance, Noah Perlman, plus Jean Chalopin, the chairman of Deltec, which is uh, known for being a big bank for FTX, but is also one of the biggest banks for Tether, USDT, right? And uh, these guys, and there were a couple other people there. There's another Deltec guy and another guy I can't quite remember, but they're the ones that bought Farmington from this other guy named Archie Chan. Um, And I wrote about Archie Chan specifically in his history last year. Um, But basically Farmington got, after it was bought by Chalopin and and, and these guys, uh, started to undergo this transition from being this rural community bank, one of the smallest banks in the country, to trying to become part of the Federal Reserve System, changing their name to Moonstone, trying to become the bank of the future and being involved specifically in like the cryptocurrency space and also like in marijuana, uh, legal marijuana and like just a a huge transformation uh, was underway there. Um, And uh, Noah Perlman, who I mentioned earlier, was like on the board of Moonstone. Also, uh, Jalopin, obviously very involved, as was his son, uh, uh, Hanvier Jalopin, who was chief digital officer of Moonstone. And um, pretty much around the same time, uh, like very small, like a couple days difference, I think, uh, Alameda Alameda Research poured like 11.5 million uh, into this bank, which was like at the time twice what they were, (laughs) the whole bank was worth. Um, And then they swell in like less than a year from 10 million in deposits to like 84 million. And like 74 million of that was just from four accounts. And 50 million of that was one account tied to Sam Bankman-Fried that was titled FTX Digital Markets. So you have 
Sean Jalapin, Dell Tech, you have SBF and FTX, and Dell Tech and FTX are obviously connected. And they're basically uh, using this, trying to use this tiny bank for something. And based on just what was, what is documentable, um, there's no way this bank should have been approved by the Fed. It should never have been made part of the Fed system. Um, and the Federal Reserve System can't explain, refuses to explain still how they approved it and why. Uh, and there's also the same sort of like no comment, nothing to see here, even though like, yes, local reporter, you bring up good points. Uh, they're, they were irrelevant to us at the time or something from like Washington financial regulators. FTX collapses and all this scrutiny obviously gets placed on this tiny bank, even from mainstream media and also from congressmen. Like it was obviously like something was going on there and it was very obvious to see. And then the Fed has since like issued like enforcement actions against Farmington and like forced it to close down. And so it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But they had big plans for it before FTX unraveled. And that's essentially what this piece is about. It's about... Um, the partnership they made right before they all of the FTX started to go to crap and just like explode, you know, um, and is basically around this company called Fluent Finance that had partnered uh, with Moonstone and Fluent Finance was specifically looking to through partnering with Moonstone spur mass adoption of a uh, U.S. dollar pig stable coin called U.S. Plus. Uh, that was basically marketing itself without saying it by name, but naming Tether, basically like a trustworthy Tether. So why are, you know, Dell Tech and FTX very tied up with Tether, including well, you know, well before FTX went under, um, just like a very known relationship there. You know, why are they using this other entity that they're hiding behind, essentially, to get involved with this new dollar paid stablecoin? According to Whitney, Fluent Finance, the issuer of the US Plus CBDC was co-founded by Bradley Allgood, Oliver Gale, and Jamie Plata. As expected, all three have some very deep connections with regulators, big commercial banks, and quite a number of international organizations, including NATO. Whitney warns that the US Plus CBDC will someday become the de facto digital currency of the United States. It won't be controlled by Jerome Powell or any US government agency, but by big commercial banks like J.P. Morgan. In her words, the U.S. is going to get the same digital currency garbage that's being issued in other countries, but it wouldn't be controlled by the Fed. It will be controlled by banking industry custodians like Jamie Dimon. A simple Google search will reveal just how huge this is. According to a Yahoo Finance article from 2022, U.S. Plus is a federated regulator-forward stablecoin. Those are the exact words, federated, and regulator forward. The article further notes that Fluent has already entered into numerous partnerships with US-based banks to integrate US Plus into their core banking systems. Fluent has also created a federation of banks that will mint and redeem US Plus. There is definitely a lot more to this, as Whitney explains, and we will probably not have the full information until it is much too late. What are your thoughts on Whitney's interview? Do you believe there is much more to all these than we are being told? Please drop your comments and observations in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.